So the, the simple question to ask is what's important to me. But another way to think about it is to recollect which experiences have actually felt meaningful. Wow. And most people have never tried that kind of work. And they, they would do it, if I ask a person to do that, their first reaction is to do it in a cursory way. Well, I'm sure my PhD program was meaningful, but when they <laughs> think about it, they will realize that their PhD program wasn't meaningful at all. It was just something they had to do. Whereas holding their kid's hand crossing the street was incredibly meaningful or having a chat with their aunt about family history was really meaningful. So another way to get at what's important now is to think through what, what you've experienced as meaningful over time. And it can by Dr. Eric Meisel, best-selling author of over 50 books and a world-leading expert on creativity, creating meaning, and building better habits. I was blown away by his insights into living a great life, and I'm incredibly excited to share this with you guys. So Eric, welcome to the show. Hi, Max. It's great to be with you. I haven't been in Switzerland in quite a while. Wow, yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited to have you. And so before I want to dive into, you know, your latest work around building a daily practice and better habits in our life, I really f first want to take a look at your ideas on meaning and life purposes, because I think those are life-changing concepts that most people probably haven't heard about yet. And they're going to help set up this later discussion on building daily practice. So can you talk to us a little bit about existential intelligence and the way that we construct meaning in our lives? Sure. Nice big subject to start with. Yes. We've been stuck for a few thousand years with a couple of paradigms that haven't helped us. One is the idea of a purpose to life, and one is the idea of a meaning to life. Both of those are linguistic tricks that confuse us about what's actually going on. So what we really need to be thinking about is not the purpose of life, but rather our life purpose choices, the decisions we make about what's important. It's a big paradigm shift from looking for a particular purpose to understanding that we have multiple purposes in life and we get to decide what those are. Something similar with meaning, meaning from my point of view is merely a certain kind of psychological experience. Like joy or hatred or anger, it's a special one, but it's merely an experience. So again, we have to move from the old-fashioned idea of seeking meaning, which everybody says, the seeker of meaning, searching for meaning, it's at the top of a mountain, it's at some guru's feet, mm. move from that to the idea of making meaning, the idea of coaxing meaning into existence, or to say that more simply, the idea of having more experiences of meaning. And that's what we're really after. Once you get this idea, then you understand lots of things suddenly. You understand that meaning is going to come and go, just like all experiences come and go. You wouldn't expect to be joyful every sp split second or angry every split second, nor can you expect your life to feel meaningful every split second. There's no reason why it should. It comes and goes. Another big idea is that things that we do in the service of meaning, like let's say writing our novel or being an activist or something, don't necessarily feel meaningful in the doing. It's a very big point. I want to go sort of slowly over this one because most people harbor the hope that while they're writing their novel, that should feel meaningful because they've decided this is what's important to them. But no, it may, feel, it may feel meaningful one day out of seven or one day out of 23 or only at the very end for one split second. <laughs> so you have to do your work irrespective of whether you're getting the experience of meaning from it or not. And to say this yet another way, <clears throat> what this means is if you organize your life around your life purposes rather than on coveting experiences of meaning, you're going to do the best job possible of making yourself proud by your efforts. Yes, that is such a fundamentally different way of, of looking at life, I think, this, this idea of making yourself proud of how you're acting and how you're living your life on a daily basis. I think it's so fundamentally different from the way that most of us look at purpose and meaning in the sense that there's some you know, feature in the universe or some god or some higher power that gives it to us and moving away from that into this idea that we can actually construct that on a daily basis. We can do it practically. This isn't uh, just abstract. We can <clears throat> identify what's important to us. It can take a little work to do that. People 
have never really sat down and, and created their list of what's important to them, their life purposes, but it's doable. You can sit down and create that list. And then every day you can have a life purpose check-in in the morning, five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, where you make decisions about which of your life purposes you're gonna to get to on that day. It's a very different way of organizing your day. Most people organize their day around their to-do list, around shoulds and responsibilities, and they're pulled about by the nose by their to-do list. By changing the way you live your life, by deciding which of your life purposes you can get to, and by to jump to the subject of our chat, by giving each one its own daily practice so that your creativity has a daily practice and your relationship building has its daily practice and your career building has its daily practice and your activism has its daily practice, kind of sounds like an overly formalistic way to, to run a day, and yet it's the only way to get to our life purposes is by knowing what they are and then by putting them into our daily schedule. Yes, that is so important. So for people that are listening to this right now, they have no idea what their life purposes might be. They maybe heard this idea for the first time. Are there some questions that they can ask themselves or how do you go about figuring out at least the right direction they want to go into to then create well, those daily practices? Sure. I mean, the basic one is what's important to me. Now, if you can't, if you can't come up with anything, then you're in some big existential dilemma, yes. right? And then you would probably need to talk to someone like, like a me <laughs> about what's going on. But most people can announce what's important to them. Now that shifts over time. And so the list you make on one day may be very different from the list you make even a week later. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say you say today that my health is really important to me. That's, that's on the top of my list or one of my top three. But tomorrow your child comes to you and says she needs a kidney because she has some rare disease. Well, you may well decide to give her your kidney and forget about the importance of your health. You are harming your own health by doing this, but you know why that's important. So your health has suddenly dropped on this list and now saving your daughter's life has gone up that list. This, these things shift for us over time, what's important to us. But you can get a snapshot for today. You can make a decision, make, decide what's important for you today. So the, the simple question to ask is what's important to me? But another way to think about it is to recollect which experiences have actually felt meaningful. Wow. And most people have never tried that kind of work. And they, they would do it, if I ask a person to do that, their first reaction is to do it in a cursory way. Well, I'm sure my PhD program was meaningful, but when they <laughs> think about it, they will realize that their PhD program wasn't meaningful at all. It was just something they had to do. Whereas holding their kid's hand crossing the street was incredibly meaningful or having a chat with their aunt about family history was really meaningful. So another way to get at what's important now is to think through what, what you've experienced as meaningful over time. And it can, they, these will be very strange, idiosyncratic little, little snapshots of your life. The biggest, you'll, first you'll try to name the big things, well, that must have been really important. And you'll notice that wasn't so important. That was just something I got hooked into doing or thought I should do. What was really important was A, B, or C. That gives you plenty of clues about how to coax meaning today. If you can identify what felt meaningful before, that gives you some good clues about what might feel meaningful today. Yeah, that's so interesting. And so what I, what I see in society right now is, is this, this focus on immediate gratification, on these, these dopamine hits that you get oftentimes from you know, social media or from alcohol or food or drugs and all of this stuff. And there's so little talk about finding what's meaningful and pursuing those now, things. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me dispute your language because everybody will say it the way you just said it, finding what's meaningful. There's nothing to find. It's a decision. Yeah. And everyone, this is not to, to pick on you, everyone yeah. uses this language, finding meaning, because this, we have 2,000 years of saying it that way. If we could stop saying it that way, if we could say there's nothing to find, and that takes... What we're do this is really an updated existentialism, right? That, that's what we're talking about is personal responsibility and making decisions about what we want to stand for. Um, in Kirism, the, the philosophy I've developed, the philosophy of life I've developed, we use the phrase, doing the next right thing. And what right means in that sentence is going to be subtle for each person. It's not necessarily the moral thing. It, maybe you need to relax next because you just worked hard for five hours. So whatever is, whatever is right is idiosyncratic. 
But keeping that in mind, doing the next right thing is a standard against which to judge, should I play another hour of this video game or not? Or should I do this or not? And, and that's a high bar to, to ask of ourselves to be ethical all the time or to be aware all the time is a very high bar. Most people don't want to go there. Most people want to flee the experience of freedom. But we have this freedom. We have this much freedom to imagine ourselves doing the next right thing and the right thing after that. And I think we're obliged to do that if we want to have our life match our hopes for our life. Yeah, that is so interesting. So there's this popular quote that says, discipline equals freedom. Would you say that has to do with that? Like that plays a role in that and that you have to be disciplined in certain you know, daily practices. You have to be disciplined in you know, doing the thing that you're supposed to do or that like is rather is, is aligned with who you actually want to be rather than, than playing those video games? Pavarotti, the late Pavarotti has a quote I like, which is people say I'm disciplined, but it's not discipline, it's devotion. And there's a big difference. So I think there's a marriage of discipline and devotion that goes into this activity that we're talking about. You can't just white knuckle life. Discipline alone is not enough. We need to be devoted to something. And it may, it may be the bizarre idea of holding up all of humanity. Now, we can't do that. That's why in Kirism we talk about absurd rebellion because it's absurd to imagine holding up the whole, the whole world. We can't do it. But we may set ourselves that kind of absurd goal and, that's, and then we're devoted to it. So yes, we could play another hour of the video game or we could do a little something in the service of a neighbor or the world. And, th and that's the devotion piece. That's not just discipline. So I don't think we can just get through life by being super disciplined. I think we need the devotion piece too. Yes, for sure. And I think that devotion then also leads to that, that pride that we, we experience, right, of, of having done the right thing. So why is, why is it pride? Like pride oftentimes in society has this negative connotation, but the way you talk about it is this, this really powerful mechanism that actually is, is I think, very closely linked to, to this fulfillment in life. So why is it pride that we should try to create? Language is super tricky, isn't it? Whatever language we speak, the words in them are super tricky. And so, for instance, a word like narcissism has no exact meaning because developmental psychologists talk about healthy narcissism. That is that strong self-image that a child might acquire if he or she is lucky. So I think, in a way, the, the two prides we're talking about, one is that egoistic, unhealthy, narcissistic pride, and the other is, is the pride that comes from healthy narcissism, where we decide that we're instrumental in life, and that we have to judge, we have to judge our behaviors, and that that's our job, and that we're both free to do that and obliged to do that. And so pride's one of those tricky words, but I think when you think of it as being proud of our own efforts, that's different from a kind of false pride of I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread or what have you. <laughs> For sure. No, that is, I think so important to, to understand this, this difference then. Yes. Love that. Now, since, since if, so if we're looking at, you know, trying to create more, more pride in our lives, right. And we, we use these daily practice. Can you share a little bit about you know, what a daily practice really is in our lives and what it entails? Well, it's a way of taking ourselves seriously. I think that's a shorthand way of talking about daily practice. It has a beginning and it has an end. If it's not demarcated, I think it's less of a practice. And it has a lot of particular elements. In the book, I go through, I think, 20 elements of practice, which I can't remember or go through in talking. But the, the main idea is that you have some ceremonial way into the thing that's important to you, maybe some maybe lighting a candle, just to say it simply, I don't mean really lighting a candle, but some demarcation so that you're now starting to write your novel, or you're now engaged in your personality upgrade practice, or you're now engaged in your health practice, whatever it is. So you ceremonially, ceremonially enter it, then you are really there. It's that Buddhist idea of when you peel a potato, you peel a potato. Well, when you're practicing your guitar, you practice your guitar. You're not also thinking about the garden needs weeding and this and that. You're really present to your practice, whatever it is. And then you ceremonially complete it. You have that sense of completion. Most people don't get much sense of completion throughout their day. 
You just do one thing after another, but they don't get that good sense of completion that really ending your daily practice well will give you. I like to also add to that as you leave your practice to say something like, I return with strength to the rest of my day to remind yourself that you haven't depleted yourself by engaging in something for 20 minutes or an hour. And there's no particular reason once you get this habit of not having multiple daily practices, that is demarcated times of the day where you do the things that are important to you. Maybe one portion of the day has to do with writing your novel, but one portion of the day has to do with having that hard conversation with your daughter about her drinking. She's drinking too much and you know you have to say something, but you don't want to. Well, you can turn that necessity, having that conversation into a certain kind of relationship building daily practice. Then for the other portions of the day when you're not engaged in your daily practice, you can hold them as meaning neutral. You can relax about whether they're meaningful or not because you've tried to seize these other meaning opportunities during the day. You've given meaning a good shot on that day and you can relax with your video game or whatever it is you want to do in that other time or your day job or whatever you have to do and not pester yourself about those times and why they're feeling so not meaningful. So this gives you a way of negotiating your day around meaning as well as getting things done. And you can, you can predict or guess which portions of your day are going to feel meaningful, that is your daily practice portions, and which portions you can let go of needing to feel meaningful. Wow, that's such an interesting way of, of looking at, at daily life. And what I find fascinating about it is like most people, when they think of practice, they understand guitar practice, right? They understand going to a gym, but, yep. but you actually talk about so many more different kinds of practice, the spiritual practice, the personal personality development upgrade, right? I think that is yep. so interesting that we can schedule time in our lives every day. Yeah, exactly and, and let me flesh that out a little bit because it, it, may, it may be a little abstract to think about a personality upgrade practice, but... Let me spend, spend a minute or two on that one to flesh it out. So I have a uh, model of personality, a vision of personality, as personality being made up of three parts. Original personality, the way we come into the world. Everybody comes into the world different. If you've had kittens or puppies or kids, you know that every creature is its own thing, comes into the world its own way. So there's original personality. Then there's formed personality, the way we stiffen over time. And then there's what I would call available personality, our remaining freedom to be the person that we want to be. So in this model, what I'm really talking about is using our available personality to kind of unstiffen our stiff personality, mm -hmm. using our freedom to become the person we want to become. Well, that's easy to understand, but what does that mean concretely? Well, let's say you identify, let's say you're a creative person and you know that you don't take enough risks in the marketplace, that it scares you to, to, to send emails to people higher up than you or bigger than you. And you understand that it would be good of you if you started taking bigger risks. That's a personality upgrade, right? That, that idea of finally taking the risks you need to take amounts to a personality upgrade. So you set aside a chunk of time it can be seven minutes, it can be two hours. The amount of time is not what's relevant. It's the returning to it every day that's relevant. Set aside a chunk of time and identify a risk and take it. It can be a real risk in the world. It could be sending that email to a famous filmmaker saying you want to intern with him. It could be that kind of risk. Or it can be a make-believe risk that you set up in your own house. Like imagine standing at the edge of your rug and jumping over from the rug to the wooden floor and kind of envisioning that you're, you're jumping over a gorge. <laughs> you're kind of envisioning a risk. So you can do a make-believe risk or you can do a real risk. Mm -hmm. But whether it's make-believe or real, you're setting aside real time to engage in this attempt at a personality upgrade. Over time, and I don't mean a lot of time, three days, four days, some amount of time, you're going to find it easier to take risks. You're going to discover that jumping off the rug was not that dangerous. And you're going to discover that sending that email to that famous filmmaker was not that dangerous, pretty much because you won't reply. <laughs> it wasn't, but it wasn't dangerous. It, was, you know, it didn't harm you. Yeah. So if you do this, whatever you choose, by the way, much of this sounds like doing stuff, but it can also be being stuff. 
the the practice can be not about doing something, but about being calmer or more passionate or something. So whatever it is you've decided is inside that daily practice, within no time, you're going to be more passionate or calmer or take bigger risks or be working on your novel or whatever. It's the real beauty of daily practice is that it bears fruit very quickly. And, and let me just piggyback one thought on this. One of the reasons daily practice is so important is not so much that if I miss a day, is that such a tragedy? No. It's that if you miss a day or two, then you start to miss weeks and months and years. That's what happens. You stop writing your novel for two days and six months later, you discover you haven't been working on your novel. <laughs> So that's the real danger. That's why dailiness is so important. It prevents this gigantically sad thing from happening where suddenly six months or two decades vanished and you have no idea what happened. That's why I think that the regularity and routine and power and importance of dailiness is what it is. Yeah. So, so what have you learned about making it this regular practice because that's I think something what most people struggle with right they may start going to the gym for a week or two and then at some point they give up so what can people do to make sure that when they start this daily practice they can actually stick to it over the long run well I have the, the book is divided into three sections the first is the elements of practice what makes for practice and the second is varieties of practice the third part is about obstacles for practice obstacles to practice those things that cause us to stop doing the practice. And I think that the smart thing to do is to try to identify what's going on. Why are you not getting to it? And I think, I think there are probably almost 20 or so obstacles to practice. Let me just pick one to give you a sense of what I'm talking about here. Here in America, this is pretty much true worldwide, but we have a special connection to the following thing. And that's the metaphor of progress the transcendental philosophers of the 18th century, the 19th century were big on the idea of progress. And in fact, the upward spiral was the imagery of the transcendentalists. We're always going up. Well, we're not really, but that's, we got sold that bill of goods about progress. Well, that's so deeply ingrained into us that if our daily practice is not providing us with a sense of progress, then we may stop it. We may say the simple thing, I'm not making any progress. That's not what the daily practice is about, progress. It's about showing up and not attaching to outcomes. So if you get clear on this, if this is your edge, if your edge is progress, that you're always wanting to make progress, that you have to do 23 sit-ups after 22 sit-ups or 24 personal best and all that stuff, all that progress stuff, well, then you can notice that for yourself. This is my edge and I don't need my practice to have anything to do with progress, that will help you stay with your practice. So it's about the careful identification of what's actually keeping you from your daily practice. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it really sounds like it's, it's really just about putting in that effort every day, right? It's just about sticking with the practice, irrespective of whether you're getting better or not in the short term. Yes, and the way you said it is kind of one half of it, and that's the discipline half. If people can get the lightness half and the love half and the passion half and the curiosity half, then they have more of the full package because it's not, we're not just going there because of habit. Remember the devotion part. Mm -hmm. We're going there because there's something about love of life or our decision to give life a thumbs up, our affirmation of life that's in this daily practice. It's not just about drudgery and showing up to seven difficult mm -hmm. things each day. It's not what it's about. It's about living a life more aligned with the things we actually love. To, to say this simply, that was simple enough, but to say, to say it differently, people like me fell in love with reading at the age of five or six. Just some, some experience of sitting there in a, in a corner of the room reading a book. That's, that, that's about as genuine an experience of love as any human being can have. It could be music for someone else. It might be imagery for someone else. It might be film for someone else. Whatever it is, that darkened theater, which we don't, that experience we don't have anymore. We fell in love with that stuff. So there's a way in which we can bring that love to our daily practice of filmmaking or novel writing or what have you. It's not just about, oh, I've got to get another seven words out. It's about 
reminding ourselves what, what a wonderful thing language can do, what, what an Orwell can do, or what a Dostoevsky can do, or what a Kafka can do, or name anybody you like, what they were able to do. And I want to do that too. I want to participate in the beauty of language. So it's kind of a long-winded response to it. It's not just about the discipline piece. It, there's a big love piece in there too. If you keep that in mind, it, it, if you're not used to keeping that in mind, it's hard to bring that to bear to your practice. But if you, if you can get this idea, then there's a way in which your practice can be more spontaneous, lighter, things on the other side, the other side of the equation from heaviness, solemnity, seriousness, and discipline. Yeah, no, I absolutely love that. It really sounds like it's, it's about re-engaging this, this childish love affair with whatever made you start that thing, right? Whether it's writing that book or doing the sports, right? It's about finding that, that internal joy again and actually loving, loving that practice. Yeah, now I, felt, I started out as a math and science boy and I fell out of love with it because it wasn't human enough for me. Huh. It, 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 it didn't really connect to the things that interested me about human nature. But I loved it when I loved it. I loved abstract math and I went to a special math and science high school and I could do math and thought I was gonna be a physicist and all of that. And then I fell out of love with it. But I just watched recently um, a very good BBC documentary on math and is it discovered or is it invented? One of those high order questions, where does math come from and what is it? Yeah which is different from two plus two equals four. That stopped interesting me, two plus two equals four. By the way, Gauguin has a wonderful quote about, I know that two plus two equals four and that infuriates me. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning it's just so boring, yeah. <laughs> you know. But the high level questions about math, about do we discover it, do we invent it? I was completely re-engaged with it through this BBC documentary. I could almost go back to math from it. So that means that there may be things that we loved back then that we discarded or moved away from or stopped loving. That may be a source of new meaning or renewed meaning for us. It may well be. Interesting. So do you, th you think you're going to go back to, to some math writing then? No. And maybe exploring that? <laughs> no, I ha I'd have to it'd be like learning Russian or Arabic or Chinese right now. Just too too much heavy sledding. <laughs> oh, I bet. <mean. laughs> so, because to do math, you actually have to do math. Yeah. And I don't want to do math. I, <laughs> I love the intellectual part of it, but not the math part of it. Yeah. <laughs> not, the, not the equations. No. <laughs> no, I'm not going back to that. No, no, okay. <laughs> but it's interesting, right? Because it really shows that, like that, that love affair with what you do, we're doing, it can actually change over time, right? So, like. You mentioned before, like those life purposes don't stay the same throughout the course of our lives. And similarly, they don't. And I, I think they also, there, I think there are also are developmental stage connections that, you know, you can't really articulate them, but I think they're real. For instance, when I was young, let's say 16, 17, 18, I really loved marching. I loved army drill. Yeah. Uh, when I was in, I started college at 16 and I joined the Air Force ROTC and I loved uh, marching. And then when I was 18, I joined the army. I loved marching. I, I don't love marching anymore. And I, <laughs> and I don't love what it all stands for. But back then as a boy, driving armored personnel carriers and, and playing with guns and all of that, it met me where I was at. You know, I'm not sure if love is the right word, but I almost want to go to some Jungian archetype thing. The, the, you know, the Jungian archetype of the, the boy dash young soldier thing. So these things change over time. And I think, we, I think we also want to repudiate some of them. Maybe repudiate is not exactly the right word, but just see them for what they were and why they were appropriate then and why they're not appropriate now. Hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. So one thing that, that seems like it's stuck with you for your entire life is this love for, for reading and for writing. I mean, you've written over 50 books now. So what does your own daily practice there look like? It depends. It depends on where I am in the state of in the stage of a book, and it depends whether or not I'm between books. So let me say it simply, because there isn't really one kind of day. I always get to the writing, but there isn't one kind of day. But if there were one kind of day, it's the idea of getting a chunk done. This is my inner language, and for me, a chunk is about a thousand words. Okay. 
And I, I call it a chunk because it, if you get inside nonfiction books very carefully, you will discern that many or most chapters are in that four to 6,000 word place. And they're often divided into four subsections called A heads, which is the technical term for the way you divide up a chapter in a nonfiction book. So essentially I do an A head a day. I'm doing, I'm doing a section of a chapter a day. That's my rhythm. And with that rhythm, um, I can do a draft of a book every 60 days, 80 days, 90 days. Then, of course, you have a draft. You're not done with that book. But because I do get to it every day, pretty much, if there's a fire to put out, I don't mean a literal fire. Here in California, there are enough literal fires to put out. But metaphorically, if there's some fire in my coaching business or if there's something going on, then I might skip a day. I'm not scared to skip a day because I know how to completely return the next day. But mostly I'm there every day. Between books, it's different. There I want to go to a blue sky place and really allow the next book to percolate up, not from just being the sequel to the thing I just did, which is the most natural place for human beings. You know, you do Star Wars and it's successful. You want to do Star Wars 2. But it would be nice to have an opening in there to not have to do Star Wars 2, but to maybe do something else that wants to percolate up. So between books, my writing day would look very different. If I'm on deadline, it might be 4,000 words a day. If, I, if I'm doing something, this is my language, if, I, if I'm doing a bit of writing that isn't available to me, like I don't really know it, then 25 words might be the day. Just getting two sentences, two accurate sentences down about the thing would be a perfectly fine day to me. I would not badmouth bad, bad mouth myself about such a day. So you can see that the days vary, but if I had to give you the characteristic day, it's a thousand words a day. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, so what does the creative process for you look like in terms of coming up with new ideas? Because you've written on so many different topics and ideas. So wh- where does all of that come from? There are many different ways to try to say this, but let me say it one way. I can get quiet enough that I actually have my brain available. Most people can't get quiet enough to think the thoughts that would percolate up if they could get more quiet. So most people are not thinking at the level they could think at if they weren't devoting so many neurons to thoughts that don't serve them. This is sort of a cognitive therapy way of looking at how I get things done. And my shorthand for this is I stay out of my own way. To give you one kind of example of how I stay out of my own way, just a small example, but it's a real example. I've done 50 books. I write in controversial subjects. I I maintain, I'm not sure, five different blogs on different places, Psychology Today and Good Men Project and Thrive Global and And so I get pushback and feedback and criticism from the world. I have never in my life replied to a piece of criticism. Wow. The second I were to do that, first, you can't win because they have all the, whoever wrote the criticism has all the world and all the time in the world to keep going with the game. (laughs) (laughs) Very true. You know, so, so they're going to win. But apart from winning, that would steal neurons that allow me to think about the next book. Wow. It's a so waste of marching ahead. Marching ahead. There are so many things that people do that waste their time that are really meaning substitutes. They're flights from freedom. They'll get engaged in some battle with a critic, not because they really want to be engaged in that battle. In fact, it's hurting them. In fact, they're probably despondent as they're doing it, but it's the way they get to avoid working on their next book. Wow. People do a million things like that, that are avoid, you know, whether it's their f- binge watching their favorite series or this, that, and the other thing. We could name a million of them. Or just, just every split second we get rechecking email, that kind of thing, checking your phone or what have you. Those are all flights from freedom. And they're also all um, anxiety bits. Uh, we haven't really talked about that, but one of the major reasons we can't do what we intend to do in life is that anxiety gets in the way. And we don't understand the extent to which anxiety threads through the creative process and all processes. And since we don't understand that, we don't arm ourselves with good anxiety management techniques, which we should. I have a book on that called uh, Managing 
Master in Creative Anxiety, which has maybe 20 categories of anxiety management techniques, which is too much for a human being to mm. g grapple with. But it does mean that there's a menu there and you can select the one or two anxiety management tools that actually serve you. Let me stay on this point for a second because I don't, I don't think people understand this very well, especially creative people who need to know this. It is so hard to get your novel written because A, B, C, D, E, and F. We could name lots of reasons. But the major one is creating is one choice after another. Should I put the comma in? Should I take the comma out? Should I send my character to Paris? Should I send my character to Prague? One choice after another, and choosing provokes anxiety. Yeah. The whole process is the choosing, and choosing, so the whole process provokes anxiety. Now, when you're in the trance of working, you don't experience that anxiety. You make choices without it feeling anxious. Doesn't mean you're making the right choice, but you're not experiencing anxiety. But the second you come out of that trance of working, let's say a truck rumbles by and it breaks you out of the trance of working, then suddenly it's really hard to face the next choice and people flee the encounter. So, they, so they've been writing for 10 minutes, their cat walks by, that distracts them and they're done for the day. So this, whole, this is all a little lesson around the importance of accepting the place of anxiety in the process because it's there going to be there and then knowing how to master it and I, I, I have a zillion tools but let me just mention one tool because if a person gets this tool then they've changed their lives and that's envisioning a switch which if you flip it you just become a calmer person it's a certain kind of visualization it's really you making a demand of yourself no more drama no more hysterics no more histrionics I just intend to be a calmer person. And that, that imagery, if a person gets that image of just flipping that switch and deciding to become calmer, then they can get a ton more work done in their life. Wow, but this is so interesting how this, this creative anxiety, and I think all of us have experienced that before, can, can actually keep us from doing the thing that we truly want to do. And so, it's so the great you, answer. That's right. Yeah. So do you think your, your, your awareness of your life purposes also helps you in, in sort of buffering against that anxiety in terms that you know what you want to do and you're so aware of that, that it helps yeah. you stay in that path? I think so. Um, from the earliest age, and I mean early, five, six, seven, I hated authoritarians. Wow. Um, I didn't grow up with a father, which I thought was wonderful. I thought it was wonderful not to have a bullying father in the household because all my friends had these bullying fathers who would come home from work and just be cruel. That was their modus operandi, to come home and be cruel. Wow. And I didn't think this was a semi-orthodox, this was a double orthodox neighborhood, orthodox Jews and orthodox Christians, both Brooklyn, certain area in Brooklyn. Uh, my mother was secular, thank God, and thought that it was all... BS, all religion and all of this authoritarian stuff. And so I knew from a very early age that I was going to fight this forever. And this was also right after post, this was right after World War II. Um, the heroics of defeating the Nazis was very clear to me. To this day, D-Day still means something to me. That's one of those things that means something to me. The amassing of that force to fight that enemy means something to me. So from that age, early age, I always knew, and then I started reading those things which supported this point of view, Orwell, um, Camus, Sartre, all the different existential writers, etc., all of whom were writing about flights from freedom, personal responsibility, and the difficulty in fighting authoritarianism, Camus has a great essay. It's called something like Letter to My German Friend. I may not have that exactly right, but I believe that's the title of it. And he's not a fr this is not a friend anymore. But he writes in, he writes in that letter, and I, I was reading these things at a very early age. He writes to his friend, we kept giving you the benefit of the doubt. We just couldn't believe you were as bad as you are. We 
humanists, we humanitarians, we French, we just didn't believe that the Nazis were who they were. And I think this goes on through human history. It's a part answer to the question, why don't people stop the bullies sooner? There's a way in which we don't quite believe they are as evil as they are. This is a long-winded this is a long-winded response to your question. It's super interesting. Is my life organized around my life purposes, yeah. Because th this is one and I have another major life purpose which is which would probably take too much time to address but it's my upsetness with the current mental disorder paradigm and my disbelief in the current mental disorder paradigm and my strong belief that psychiatry is not medicine. And this would be a lot to talk about. I've done three, four, five, six books in this area. Um, I blog in this area. Um, I think in, it's one thing if an adult wants to buy a mental disorder label. These are not diagnoses, they're just labels. It's one thing if an adult wants to do it, that's his or her right. But what we're doing to kids is unconscionable. Giving millions and millions and millions of kids who have no power, these ADHD and ODD and, and childhood bipolar and this, that, and that, these labels is terrible. And then giving them the chemicals that flow from the, so to speak, diagnosis is doubly terrible. So that's all by way of saying we could talk about that for 19 hours, but that's by way of saying that's another of my life purpose places is in fighting that humbug. And maybe there's a way in which I could say that all of my life purposes come around to the same disputing humbug. It's the emperor's, mm. emperor's new clothes fairy tale. I think I've always felt like that kid saying, he's got no clothes on, what are you all doing? <laughs> What's wrong with you all? Mm. Can't you see that the emperor has no clothes? That may be in a nutshell my whole life purpose. <laughs> For sure, no, it's such a beautiful purpose. So is that something that sort of evolved over time, these different strings of life purposes? Or was there sort of one moment where you, you had this realization that this is now what I want to dedicate my life to? Uh, I'm not sure if there were moments. Um, I grew up in a household um, where my mother had three sisters. So she and Aunt Rose were solid and sane. And Faye and Anne were nutty as fruitcakes. And uh, so I grew up with a lot of um, eccentricities. Uh, and I also grew up traveling with my grandfather, who was an immigrant Russian or Polish Jew. They weren't quite sure where they came from. An immigrant Jew who worked in the garment district in, in New York. And I would travel with him on the occasional Sunday up to Rockland State Mental Institution, where... Aunt Faye was incarcerated. Um, and I, all of this is completely clear to me to this day. First, we'd go to the live chicken uh, market and he'd pick out a chicken to bring up to Faye, which is all crazy. It was crazy itself to be bringing this <laughs> <Life institutional chicken. laughs> woman. Well, it was not now live. You would pick the live chicken and they'd chop the head off and pluck oh. it for you. <laughs> so you were bringing a fresh chicken <laughs> up on the train to God knows why. I can't tell you what yeah. that was all about. But I had early understanding of this sort of thing, and it was in my consciousness. Hmm. Also, my brother who was half a generation, my half-brother who was half a generation older than me, um, was interested in this and did his uh, PhD at Yale in sociology, and his, his doctoral dissertation was on recidivism rate of mental patients. That is, once you let them out, how often did they come back? So all of this was in my consciousness growing up, interest in this thing called mental illness and what the heck is it? And what the heck do you do with these people who are difficult? It's not that they deserve these labels, but they are difficult. So what do you, what do, you do with, what does society do with a person who's presenting themselves as difficult? So that's been interesting me all the way through. As to moments, I can't quite say, um, there was certainly a moment where I started writing my first novel. So there's that kind of moment. And, you know, there are probably markers that I, I could, if I, if I struggled, I could probably 
find certain, what are they called, in, in inflection points. I think that's what we call them nowadays. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't know offhand. For me, they, they seem to be rooted in, Ken, you said something like, um, a writer's always working on the same three issues from childhood. And I suspect that that's rather true for me. I wouldn't call them issues, but three interest areas around authoritarians and bullying, mental illness, those sorts of things have anti-religion, anti-belief system, anti -belief systems that made no sense to me, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, it sounds like at the end of the day, you're always seeking the, the truth, right? You're always seeking the thing that's, that's actually going to help people live, live sort of as the highest version of themselves. Yeah, I mean, we know that the truth is such a difficult word nowadays. Yes. Uh, and it's easy to deconstruct. Um, Solzhenitsyn, in his Nobel Prize speech, said the following thing. He said that Dostoevsky and other 19th century novelists believed in the phrase truth, beauty, and goodness. And we moderns, Solzhenitsyn was saying, we moderns can't deal with that phrase anymore. We've deconstructed truth and beauty and goodness to the extent that it makes no sense to us anymore. And yet he was right. And we have to circle all the way back around all of our postmodern deconstructive abilities and engage in some kind of reconstructive postmodernism where truth, beauty, and goodness mean something again. So I would say, in, in, re, in answer to your question, I do believe in truth, beauty, and goodness, even though I'm as good as anybody at deconstructing those three words. <laughs> no, I absolutely love that. So, so what have been some of the the biggest insights for you on that journey. I mean, you've been in this field for, for decades and decades. What if you, for, you know, you personally have been the most influential ideas that you've, you've either come up yourself with or, or learned from others? Well, I think, how shall I say this? Um, in, in about the mid 1990s, I had done um, a couple of books with Jeremy Tarcher. Um, and then uh, suggested a book I called Lighting the Way, which was to be about everything I knew about meaning and life purpose. So this is 25 years ago. I wrote a terrible book because I didn't know what I knew uh -huh. about life purpose and meaning then. It was an unpublishable book, and in fact, they couldn't publish it. I got, I got a nice advancement, but they couldn't publish it because I didn't know what I was saying yet then. So I would say that the biggest insights have come over time in the ways of making these distinctions between the purpose of life and life purpose choosing and the meaning of life and meaning as a certain kind of psychological experience and meaning as something that comes and goes as opposed to something you should expect to have at all times, etc. All of the stuff around life purpose and meaning and also all the stuff around the difference between mental disorder diagnosing versus mental disorder labeling, all of these things have come to me over time. And they're now my big understandings as to when exactly I, I knew them or learned them that I can't say anymore. Okay. So when, when it comes to this, this meaning and purpose, what are some insights that you think everybody you know, listening to this should, should also gain um, in order to live better lives? Anything there that we haven't touched up on yet? Well, plenty, but let me just give maybe a useful headline or two. In my view of meaning, and I think it's the accurate one, in my view of meaning, meaning becomes a, a wellspring and an infinite resource. All, all, everyone who's struggling with where is meaning, it ain't anywhere. It's a certain kind of experience, but you can have it. You may not have it this split second. Maybe too much is going on such that you, maybe inadvertently you've given life a thumbs down. Many people have. Many people feel they thought it was going to be some other way, and here it is this way. So a lot of people have given life a thumbs down. For me, they have, we have to give life a thumbs up. While we're, this is part of that personal responsibility thing and, and donning the mantle of meaning maker. We have to put, put the world on our shoulders again, even though it doesn't deserve us so to speak. It may not deserve our efforts, but still we have to do that. We have to put it on our shoulders. And so I guess the big insight is you can have more meaning than you currently have by learning how to coax meaning into existence. And that's a big conversation with many, many sentences and many minutes. But you can't, I guess I would just 
send folks to my new book, Lighting the Way, which is in which I introduce Kirism, the philosophy of life I've been developing. We've been the side talking about the power of daily practice, which is which is my newest, newest book. But Lighting the Way just came out two or three months ago. And so between the two of them, I think you would have a real picture of A, how to live a life, and B, how daily practice becomes a super important tool in living that life. Fantastic. Absolutely love that. Now, um, on the show, we always love to celebrate failure as a stepping stone for learning and for personal development. So throughout your whole life and career, have you had a favorite failure? Well, the one I mentioned about lighting the way has always stayed with me as a particular um, failure, as a particular event that I wanted to transcend or, or redo or undo or do, do something mm -hmm. with. So um, there's that one. I, su I suspect there are plenty of others, but I'm not sure what wants to um, percolate up at this sentence at this you know this is a funny thing this is not a failure this is going to sound so goofy trivial mm. and yet it just pops into my head i had once done a book which was one of my best sellers which was just a blank book <laughs> it was called um what was it called artists speak which is really just a sketchbook and journal for artists with some quotes so it was essentially <laughs> a blank book but it did very well wow. <laughs> so so a publisher wanted to do the follow-up and because that book had come out in two sizes they wondered which size i wanted no no they they asked for the numbers on those two sizes so that they could gauge which was the there was a little little book and a big book <laughs> <laughs> and i knew tactically that i should say that one outsold the other i knew that yeah. tactically i shouldn't make them have to try to choose between two identical sellers and yet I decided to tell the truth. And both had sold maybe 10,000 copies or something. And so they had to pass because they couldn't decide which one they wanted to do. Wow. Which was for me a big, a big not even an alert, because I already knew the right answer. It, it, it was a reinforcement of a learning that telling the truth has its consequences. Mm -hmm. Bizarre consequences like that. It doesn't mean I don't now tell the truth. But I'm very aware of this, of the way the marketplace doesn't want the truth. It wants what it wants. Mm. So I'm not sure whether that was a failure. It just pops into my mind as, as, as a moment. <laughs> <laughs> An interesting learning for sure. So before we wrap it up, where can listeners connect with you online? Um, the most straightforward place is my website, ericmaisel.com, E-R-I-C-M-A-I-S-E-L.com. Um, I have a blog on psychology today called uh, Rethinking Mental Health that has had several million views, so that's a place to go. I also do three blogs for the Good Men Project. Um, so I guess that's where to go, basically to my website or, or to my blog places. Fantastic. I'll link to that. So final question, what does it mean for you to max out your life? To, to, what to max out life? your life. I think at this moment, I, I'm guessing that I would give a different answer every six months. <laughs> but I think at this moment, it's to disseminate this philosophy of life so that there is an alternative way of thinking about life for some number of people. And I guess it's a kind of numbers game. I guess to max out would be to have 63 and a half billion people be <laughs> interested in, in this new philosophy of life, or at least a few. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Hey, Eric, thank you so much for coming in the show. All right, guys, that's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you gained some valuable ideas, tips, tools, tricks, mindsets, belief systems that will hopefully inspire you to take your life to the next level. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about application. The only thing that's going to set you apart tomorrow from where you are today is how much action you take with those ideas that you gained. And so I really want to challenge you at this point to you know, not just listen to this passively, to not just consume this, you know, passively just thinking about other things, but to really take those lessons, take those ideas that you just gained and start applying them to your life. So to really start taking action and sprinting towards those goals and those dreams that you have in your life. Now, guys, at this point, I want to ask you for a huge favor. If you enjoyed this episode, 
please consider heading over to iTunes and leaving a review as that helps me really grow the show and reach more people, impact even more people around the world. You know, if you have a family member, friend, a loved one maybe that you think could benefit from this content, please consider, you know, sharing it with them, forwarding to them as that helps us really build a community of like-minded people that are all about maxing out their lives. Now guys, with that being said, thanks so much for tuning in today. I really, really appreciate it. Stay strong and see you tomorrow.